It's not unusual for people to not know the name of John Stringfellow because he's one of those Victorian characters that was enthusiastic about flight, but he's always been overshadowed by other members, especially the Wright brothers, who are the people we all think about as inventing flight. John Stringfellow came to Somerset from his home in Nottingham, and he, by trade he was a machinist who looked after the machines in the lace mills. And following the, the Luddite riots, he then came down to Somerset because a lot of the weaving of cloth came to Somerset. Now, although his main job was an engineer, and he was, by the sound of it, a very talented engineer, he had a very close interest in flight, how things fly. Now, we're looking and talking in terms of around about 1830, so we're quite a long 70 years away from when Wright Brothers. He basically started off by trying to understand how birds fly, and from there on he moved to making models to, to understand why things stay in the air. Um, while he was in Chard, he got connected to another person called William Henson. And William Henson was um, more of a scientist than a engineer. And to give you an example, he patented, and this was in about the 19, 1830s, he patented an idea of an aerial steam carriage that would fly from England to India, and it would carry 30, 40, 50 people, all powered by steam engines. But to cut the long story short, he and Stringfellow started working together on understanding how they could make an aeroplane fly powered by a small steam engine. It started around about 1840 when they uh, built the first design, and there's a copy of this in the museum, the large aircraft down at the end of the hall. And that was powered by a very small steam engine that was fed by methylated spirits. They tried to fly it, but basically because of the technology they had and the, they didn't have a full understanding of how things fly and how to make things strong enough, it never got off the ground. And also, this was an attempted flight outside and the weather conditions, the wind, the rain, etc., in the charred area didn't make it work. He then decided that they'd been going down the wrong road and decided that they had to make the aeroplane smaller to make it stronger. And from there on, and this was around about the 1845, 1848, he developed what was called the bat machine, which had wings shaped like a, a bat. And again, there's a copy model of it in the museum hung up behind me. The story is that they flew it in the, um, at the top of the lace mill strung on a wire. So basically, the wire was halfway along the race, lace mill in the loft. They powered it up, started it, it chugged along, got to the end of the uh, wire and took off and flew for the rest of the distance. So we're looking at probably something 40, perhaps 50 yards in, in distance. Um, but you have to understand that although he understood the process of how to get lift. There was no control on this aircraft. So there was no control, no ailerons, no elevators, or anything like that. It was just, in fact, a large model. And again, it was too small to carry any people. So uh, it was a good stepping stone to understand how flight developed in the Victorian era. Later on in the 1860s, the Royal Aeronautical Society was formed. And when it was formed, he was invited to design an aeroplane that would go in the Crystal Palace. Um, so he designed the triplane, which uh, also is made, uh, displayed in the museum. Now, interestingly, this triplane is a model itself that was built by the Science Museum in 1930. So even that's close on 90 years old. 
This again was powered by a small steam-powered engine. Uh, and again, allegedly it flew on a wire after everybody had gone home in the Crystal Palace because they didn't want it bursting into flames and setting fire to everything. So that was his third stage of adventures with flight. Um, he didn't get to the stage of the Wright brothers. Um, he was certainly a very important stepping stone to understanding the theory of flight, how it happened, and also the size of aeroplanes have to be to make them fly. Did the, the, the Wright brothers glean any of this information? The story was that the Wright brothers went and looked at everybody's information. So there was a German pilot called Otto Littienthal, who was virtually one of the early hang gliders, and he designed aero sections for the wings. So my suspicion is probably they did look at everything that was there um, and basically used it and adapted it. So I'm, I'm sure they knew about Stringfellow. How do people treat this rather clever inventor? In the town, he's, he is well known in the town. And also in this sort of area of Somerset, he's relatively well known. Um, what is fascinating is his name has never really gone further into the, the annals and there's been several uh, programmes produced on television where in fact he didn't even get a mention. Um, so it is a relatively unusual situation that he's known around the town. He's also known for lots of other things. Um, he was a great enthusiast for photography and um, he, he had lots of photographs and images. And he was also an amazing character. He actually developed and invented a dry cell battery in the 1830s that was sort of so innovative. So it wasn't just one thing that he did. He had a very inquiring, practical mind.